All right, well, hello, Beacon Church. My name's Adam. I'm an elder in training here at Beacon Church. And this is our responsive reading, where we confess the faith that unites us together as a body in Christ. For this, we use the material of the New City Catechism, which gives us a series of questions and answers that systematically go through what we believe. And this is a helpful material, but ultimately we use it as a springboard for us to briefly consider what the scriptures teach us, since God's word is authoritative, not the writings of men nor their traditions. So today we ask, what is the church? And to answer this, I want to start off by looking at 2 Thessalonians, uh, verse, or chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. Um, this, just to set the, the background here, this is Paul's second letter to the church in Thessalonica, at least the second one that we have in the, the canon of scripture. Paul begins the chapter by warning the church against the man of lawlessness, the son of destruction, and those who follow him who are characterized by not believing the truth, but having pleasure in unrighteousness. So in contrast to that, in contrast to these people who are lawless, who are of destruction, who do not believe, who take pleasure in unrighteousness, what then is the church? What does Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, say marks the church as being the true church? Picking up at verse 13, but we ought always to thank or to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this he called you through our gospel, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or our letter. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. So from this, we see that these were people first chosen by God to be saved by the Spirit through faith. As, as Paul wrote, but we ought always to get God... Sorry. But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved by the Lord, because he chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in truth. So they were chosen by God to be saved through faith. And I want to emphasize here, as this passage does, that they were not chosen for good deeds which they had done or some other qualification that God might have sought in them. They were chosen by grace and saved through faith. Faith in what? What did they believe in? Well, to this he called you through our gospel, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus Christ is how they were saved. So they were marked by their salvation in Christ, salvation through faith in Christ. So they believed the gospel of Jesus Christ, that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. That for our sake, God made him to be sin who knew no sin, that we who... Uh, that we might become the righteousness of God. And upon believing this, we have received the spirit of adoption as sons. We become part of the larger community and family of God's family. And we can be sure that he who began a good work in us will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. These are all things that come right from Paul's other writings, as uh, ways of working out the gospel which these people would have believed under his teaching. So as Christ's church there are things that we believe. That's the, the key characteristic of a Christian is what they believe. But that's not it. It doesn't just stop with what you believe. It should affect your life also. As Christ Church, we have a command to proclaim the gospel and to show the here but not yet reality of Christ's coming kingdom, which he has established in our hearts and will one day establish here in this world. At the end of Matthew's gospel account, Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of this age. And this is what we see of the early church in Acts chapter 2, verses 40 through 42, where we read, And with many other words, he, and this is speaking of Peter here, Peter bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. 
So we see that the growth of the early church was due to Peter boldly proclaiming the gospel. And those who believed were baptized. And as a community, they were then characterized in their actions by following the apostles' teaching, which we have recorded for us in the New Testament. They were characterized by their fellowship together as believers in Christ, by their corporate worship or the breaking of bread, and by praying together. If you participated with us in our seasons of prayer, you may have noticed in the prayer tools that this is largely the outline of most of those tools. There's a couple of other subjects, but this is the basis for the, those prayer tools. These are the things that are clearly taught that should characterize the church, and these are the things then that we thought were wise then to uplift in prayer before God that would be evident in our midst. Um, but to try and summarize this, saying this a different way, all of these things, uh, I think it's good to say that the church is an embassy. Uh, we are citizens of the coming kingdom of Jesus, a citizenship, that, a citizenship that we do not hold by merit, but by faith in Jesus Christ. And as citizens of this coming kingdom, we are ambassadors. That is, we're authorized to be representatives or messengers. So we're ambassadors for Jesus, called and authorized by him to proclaim his love to all people, that they might also be called into his coming kingdom. This isn't something I've made up or that anybody else has made up. If I look to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9-10, through 10, he said, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So I invite you now to join me in this responsive reading that should appear on your screen shortly. I will read the question and I invite you to join with me in reading the answer. What is the church? God chooses and preserves for himself a community elected for eternal life and united by faith who love, follow, learn from, and worship God together. God sends this community to proclaim the gospel and prefigure Christ's kingdom by the quality of their life together and their love for one another. I'll just take a moment here to pray. Lord, I thank you that you, according to your wisdom and according to your will, you have chosen a people for yourself, a people that by human standards we would not choose. For we are characterized of ourselves, Lord, by sin. Yet you saw fit to send your Son to bear your wrath against our sin, that we who place our faith in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Lord, I pray that you would help us to walk then worthy of the name by which we are called, that you would daily, Lord, uphold us by your grace, that you teach us the, the foolishness of striving by our own strength to serve you, but, Lord, that you would teach us then to appeal to you, to remember our dependence upon you, just as we are dependent upon you for our salvation, so are we dependent on you day by day as to how we live out our lives. Lord, by your grace, uphold us and help us to be a people who truly are ambassadors, who represent you well on this earth for the glory of your name. For that is what we desire, and that's what we pray for in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>